Now I have the honor of presenting Dr. Ritu Nayar. Uh, Ritu is uh, Professor of Pathology and Medical Education, Vice Chair of Pathology Education and Faculty Development and Director of Cytopathology at Northwestern uh, Feinberg School of Medicine and Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago. Uh, Ritu has been active in mainstream organized pathology since she was a resident. She's had major leadership roles everywhere. Um, she is past president of the American Society of Cytopathology, member of the Executive Committee of the International uh, uh, Academy of uh, Cytology, chair of the Cytopathology Education and Technology Consortium, CECT, and chair of the resident physician section of AASCP. She's published extensively in the literature. She's responsible for uh, the last two uh, Bethesda uh, editions. Um, she is uh, that influence that she created led to all of our diagnostic system book. I have uh, learned to salute and appreciate everything about her. And um, uh, I do call my wife uh, sometimes Migami-sama, which is Japanese for goddess. I think Ritu fits in that class. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dan, for that very kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to speak here this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed listening to all the presentations so far and learned so much. Um, it's amazing what, what history can teach you, but I have no uh, conflicts to declare. So I'd like to take you uh, for a walk down memory lane and tell you a little bit about the history of the Bethesda system for reporting cervical cytology and the impact that it's had, as Dan was saying, on the creation of other standardized terminology systems in the area of cytopathology and beyond. So the story goes back to the late 1980s when investigative reporter Walt Bogdanich wrote a series of really damning articles about uh, the inaccuracies in laboratory testing. And unfortunately, a lot of this re uh, breaking news focused on so-called pap mills where pap smears were being screened in less than ideal conditions and leading to poor outcomes. So it's not surprising we are in the US. So public outcry as well as litigation and uh, legislation ensued. So Congress passed the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act of 1988 that demanded better quality reporting uh, from all laboratories, especially those in smaller physicians' offices and from the labs who were reporting pap smears with a lot of more quality assurance measures that were introduced. So at this time, there was a lot of variability in how pap smears were reported. There was the Papanicolaou numer numerical system that people used with a lot of idiosyncratic variations. Then there was the dysplasia and CIN terminology that had a lot of gradations, including biologically irrelevant differences between uh, um, coilocytic change and true dysplasia or not, and then poorly reproducible differences even between severe dysplasia and carcinoma in situ that was sometimes used to make drastic management decisions, like whether a woman should have a hysterectomy or not. So at this time, the National Cancer Institute stepped in and uh, undertook the responsibility of creating a reporting system for cervical cytology that would communicate results in a clear and relevant fashion. They organized a workshop in Bethesda, Maryland, which was ably led by Diane Solomon and Robert Kerman. And they gathered a group of experts in, with experience in cytopathology, histopathology, and the clinical management of abnormal um, uh, tests for uh, cervical cancer detection. And the result was the first Bethesda system for reporting cervical cytologic diagnosis. So there were some guiding principles that Bethesda was formulated upon that remain true until today. Firstly, it must communicate clinically relevant information to the healthcare provider. Secondly, it should be reasonably reproducible and also flexible enough to be adopted over a wide variety of laboratories as well as geographic locations. And thirdly, it must represent the current understanding of cervical neoplasia. So here we had the creation of now a standardized framework for laboratory pap test reports 
It included a specimen adequacy statement. And by some, this is considered to be the most important quality assurance uh, measure that was brought into standardized reporting. There was an optional general category, optional because of the vari uh, variations in the lab information systems that we all have, and then a descriptive diagnosis. Bethesda decided to use uh, a two-tier system for reporting squamous intraepithelial lesions, L-cell and H-cell, in an effort to improve inter- and intra-observer reproducibility. And also at that time, it was becoming obvious from the history of HPV and cervical carcinogenesis that the morphologic variations that we see are not necessarily a continuum. Now, from its, the onset, Bethesda was meant to evolve with our advances in knowledge of HPV and uh, uh, cervical carcinogenesis and with use in the laboratories. So in um, 1991, by which time in three years, the system had been adopted widely in the US and outside the US actually. The NCI held a second workshop to look at uh, its use in practice and consider areas for improvement. The result was a refined format as well as uh, more precise criteria for the diagnostic um, descriptions that were used as well as for, for the adequacy requirements. This information was brought uh, forward to the pathology community in the form of the first Bethesda Atlas. And also realizing at the time that data was lacking, the NCI also sponsored the development of interim guidelines for the management of the abnormal cervical cytology results that were going to be uh, put forward based on the Bethesda terminology. So fast forward to the 1990s. At this time, there were significant advances in the understanding of the biology of cervical cancer. HPV tests became available for use in laboratories and liquid-based cytology was introduced. Among all the changes that were introduced by Bethesda, none was more controversial or unpopular than ASCUS. ASCUS was, is, and will always be the most, uh, most frequent abnormality in pap smear reporting. Here, as you can see, ASCUS along with LCIL, and at the time when we did annual PAPs, this meant millions of women Together, this placed a substantial burden on the healthcare facilities that were available. So the NCI came in again and said, okay, let's look at the various options that are available to manage women with these low-grade equivocal abnormalities of ASCUS and LCIL and find what the best option is. So they organized this landmark trial, the ASCUS low-grade triage study, or ALS, to look at what the best way of managing was among these three options. This uh, was a seminal trial in, uh, which resulted in over 50 publications. And I want to point out just three of them that I think had significant impact at the time on our practice patterns. Firstly, HPV triage of ASCUS clearly showed that ASCUS that was HPV positive was biologically the same as LCIL and had an almost identical follow-up uh, risk of high-grade disease or CIM23 over a period of time. On the other hand, ASCUS HPV negative was a far safer option, just a little bit higher risk than actually a normal PAP test at the time. So it became clear that HPV testing was the best way to manage these women and also the most cost-effective. Secondly, when uh, looking at the cytology and histopathology that was part of this trial, by experts uh, and comparing it to the original diagnosis made by, by the institutions that were part of the trial, it was shown that inter-observer reproducibility was actually similar between cytology and histopathology and was at best, if you look at those kappas, fair to moderate. So this really raised the question of the, and, uh, and uh, put into question, I would say, the long-held belief that histopathology was the gold standard compared to cytopathology. It certainly wasn't, especially where CIN1 was concerned. Similarly for colposcopy, it has its own limitations and is also subjective. In the ALS trial, it detected only about two-thirds of incident uh, CIN3 at the end of the trial. And more interestingly, if you looked at the experience of the healthcare provider who was performing the colposcopy, there was not a huge 
uh, difference in the sensitivity of detection of high-grade disease. In fact, the only thing that really increased sensitivity was if more two or more biopsies were taken. So at this time, we could conclude that cervical diagnosis is both an art and a science. There is no gold standard. And all our processes, cytology, his colposcopy, and the resulting biopsies are all with their limitations and their advantages. So came the 2000s, about 10 years later. At this time, uh, it, a lot had happened, both with advances in science as well as in technology. The internet had become available. It was still relatively new at that time, but by now Bethesda was actually quite international. So we decided that we would uh, do an update uh, in, in 2001, which would entail, uh, we had uh, thought, a lot of changes actually. And uh, to broaden participation and obtain consensus from everybody was, who was using this internationally, there was a bulletin board where draft recommendations were put forward before an actual workshop occurred again in Bethesda that was much larger, multidisciplinary with uh, people from all over the world. And this is where my small contribution first began. I was a very uh, junior faculty member at that time, and I just attended this conference along with all of these other people. You can actually see Dan Curtis here on my left. Dan, I, I just noticed that the other day, actually. You look young and handsome over there, as yes. always. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and here's one of my mentors, Dr. S uh, Steve Silverberg, uh, and there's Diane Solomon and Robert Kerman right there. So let's look at some of the key uh, discussions and outcomes of this uh, major update uh, of Bethesda. Firstly, it was actually asked whether should we even retain as atypia within the Bethesda system? There were fierce pros and cons, and there were some very famous pathologists who argued against dropping it. They said, just say nil or else uh, or sil, uh, and forget about these atypical categories. But retrospective studies, looking back from histology proven HCL, as well as modeling, showed that in fact, if we eliminated ASCUS, there would be an unacceptable loss of sensitivity and positive uh, predictive value for HCL from uh, cytology. So it was quite obvious and accepted then that equivocal interpretations are a reality of morphologic diagnosis that remains true today. And they're necessary in screening tests to keep a good balance between sensitivity and specificity. However, it is important to try to define the type of atypia to allow for more appropriate management. Until the time of this update, there were various descriptors being used for atypia, atypical favor reactive, atypical favor dysplasia, atypical parakeratosis, and on and on. So you can imagine that for the clinicians who were getting this re these reports, they were scared because sometimes or most of the time the patients had nothing, but sometimes they had cancer or they had high grade, and we were not being able to really po po define this atypia in any uh, fashion that provided a risk estimation or a guidance for management. So at this time, this was published in the New England Journal, the uh, biology and association of HPV with uh, cervical cancer. By, by this time, IARC had, dis, uh, had declared HPV as a necessary cause of cervical carcinogenesis. And it became clear that HPV infects the cervix and in fact, the in, entire inogenital tract in two distinct fashions. The first is as a self-limiting low-grade infection, which we recognize as LCIL. Most of that spontaneously regresses without any treatment over a period of anywhere from six months to two years. The second form is in that of pre-cancer, which is caused by having a high risk virus that persists usually over two years and then progresses to, uh, by transforming the cell to a high grade lesion that we recognize as either H cell or CIN23. So at this time, the focus of cervical cancer actually shifted to detecting pre-cancer or H cell from the previously held um, management, which was to detect any kind of cell and treat it. So we were doing leaps on L cells, which was way over treating these until the early uh, 2000s to mid 2000s. So in 2001, the ASC or ASCUS terminology uh, was simplified into a dichotomous system of qualifiers, ASC US and ASC H, 
that correlated with the biology. So we just had these two that were well defined and uh, uh, provide in an aim to provide management uh, 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 correlation as well as avoid uh, the unnecessary uh, surprises that clinicians got from all the variations earlier. And of course, it correlated with biology. So it again went along with the principles established by Bethesda. Another important thing that happened in 2001 was the acceptance that we could actually recognize glandular abnormalities. This was quite controversial because as we heard, uh, the IA spatula and uh, the papinocolau test was designed to test for ectocervical abnormalities. At that time, there were no brooms or brushes, but now we could sample higher up in the endocervical canal. So in 2001, the um, criteria as well as the terminology for endocervical AIS was formally introduced into the Bethesda system. And the terminology of agus, atypical glandular cells, similar to ascus, was dropped, renamed as atypical glandular cells. It was uh, very clear by then that this is a much higher risk abnormality than atypical squamous cells that will not be uh, managed appropriately by HPV triage. It needed much more aggressive management. So Bethesda 2001 um, devised a two-tier sort of method for reporting glandular cells by specifying firstly the cell type uh, in the glandular area and then the severity of disease which would then inform management. All these patients go to pulpo biopsy, ECC, and or endometrial biopsy initially, depending on age. But then if you don't find anything uh, on these, which is not uncommon, there must be a cone or a leap done for the AGC favored neoplastic, which is the same management as AIS. So this was quite transformational at that time. And uh, important also, because by this time, we had started seeing a lot of deaths from endocervical adenocarcinoma uh, in uh, younger women, and it was uh, becoming uh, another source of um, major litigation in uh, pap smears. So a number of bed, uh, quality assurance measures were introduced for both, uh, for atypia, both squamous as well as glandular benchmarking became available, not only for atypia, but for all Bethesda categories. So we could actually have a sense of how each lab was doing compared to other labs. And also there were ways of looking at um, uh, ask things like ascosil ratio that would control for the risk of patient, uh, patients that your lab had depending on where you were. Also landmark in 2001 was the collaboration with the OBGYNs and nurse practitioners, basically anyone who was involved and stakeholder in the management of abnormal cytology or histology reports. The ASCCP uh, was part of the Bethesda conference uh, that occurred at this time. And uh, they stayed back right after the conference in the same center and had their own conference where they tailored management strategies conforming to each of the Bethesda interpretation categories. So this was really you know, quite landmark at that time that we had now had tailoring of terminology and guidelines. And ever since then, we've had the closest relationships between pathology, cytopathologists, and the OBGYN community and their associations, and have been involved uh, in all their screening and management guideline updates up till now. So after the conference, uh, Diane Solomon, who was uh, still at the NCI, approached the American, Cancer, uh, American Society of Cytology, ASC, and said, would you help with the dissemination of Bethesda 2001, and then eventually from NCI take over the future of uh, this uh, Bethesda system. So I was very honored to have been appointed by the ASC executive board at that time as her co-chair. Um, this was quite intimid intimidating. I was quite a junior faculty member at that time, but she was wonderful and uh, we had a great working relationship. And of course, there were so many wonderful people involved in the Bethesda e effort. It certainly wasn't just the two of us that contributed. So it, it was really a true labor of love. Uh, we had two go three goals actually. We gave ourselves the goals uh, to publish uh, a second edition that would be much more robust of the print atlas, but also to have a Bethesda website as a companion. This was again quite revolutionary. We're talking more than 20 years ago, uh, not much education uh, existed on, uh, on websites or on the internet at that time. And then also to perform an inter-observer reproducibility study to see how uh, we, as a baseline, and also to see what were our pain points in cervical uh, cytology diagnoses. 
So uh, this second uh, edition of the Atlas had a much more robust new format that uh, we introduced that has uh, stood the test of time for this as well as other uh, methods and uh, all editors as well as authors gave up uh, royalties so that we could keep the price of the book low and affordable around the world. And Dr. Curtis stepped in. Uh, we had a team at the NCI who was supporting the website, but he was extremely uh, important in uh, the actual coming to fruition of the website, which at that time would, was the more largest cytology-based uh, internet uh, education tool available and had over 350 images. Remember at that time, liquid cytology was just being uh, it had been introduced, not many labs were using it, so it had multiple methods to search for different types of uh, uh, preparations, etc. So it was a great learning experience that was very useful to labs in the U.S. and outside. There was a self-study test, which many, many 80 or 90,000 people, I think, did uh, in the 10 years that this website was uh, available. So um, many thanks to Dan, where, where he started this and then he's remained committed and continued uh, and has been you know, key to the development of uh, internet and website uh, websites for all our terminology systems, as well as the reproducibility studies. So the idea of doing the reproducibility study was to get an idea of the real life performance uh, in practice of glass slides, uh, of, of uh, the uh, interpretations. And uh, also uh, the results that we got from this uh, gave us some uh, ammunition, I think, to show that this was a phenomenon or a limitation of morphology that we had in difficult lesions. It was not necessarily a function of the person who was interpreting, but also of the difficult lesions like glandular lesions. So uh, we, it, it was really, really, I was told by many people from around the world, proved useful to them when there were litigation cases and they were you know, practicing at the standard of care in their laboratories, but they were not doing pap mill type of screening. So it, it gave a really nice baseline that helped education efforts, but also it gave a reality check about how far we can go with morphology. And also uh, it supported the use of ancillary tests to, um, to refine the process of screening. So subsequent to this over the next 15 years, uh, the development and dissemination strategies utilized by Bethesda, especially from the 2001 uh, update, major update, uh, were used by um, many other areas in cytopathology to develop standardized reporting in FNA and non-GYN. And each of these brought something new and they together furthered our efforts to uh, partner with our clinicians give our reports in a standardized format that had a risk associated with it, and that could um, then inform management, thus improving patient care. Also, the LCIL, HCIL two-tier terminology was utilized by um, uh, histopathology. There was this project done by the ASCCP and uh, CAP, because the biology of HPV-associated squamous lesions is the same all throughout the anogenital tract. So here, instead of HPV testing, uh, P16 immunohistochemistry was suggested uh, to further qualify the equivocal CIM2, which is basically the ASCUS of histopathology. Now, by the uh, mid-2000s, uh, there was a major milestone that occurred that changed the face of cervical cancer prevention around the world, and that was the development of primary prevention or HPV vaccines. It was in 2006 that the first generation of prophylactic vaccines were released and uh, countries with organized screening programs adopted them in a school-based format, had high compliance. In the United States, it took a while, first for girls and then for boys and herd immunity development, even at low, uh, relatively low in the 50s range of uptake there was a significant decrease in pre-cancer caused uh, by vaccine types at that time, 16 and 18 in younger uh, individuals who got the vaccine. Now we have the second generation vaccine, Gardasil 9, that's distributed in the United States to, since 2017. It can prevent 87% of cervical cancer. In which other cancer do you have this power? 
And as of 2020, we've really improved. This was pre-COVID, of course, uh, that uh, now 75% of uh, adolescents who are eligible in the US have received one or more dose of the vaccine and almost 60% are up to date. So it's evident now with the data that we have and that began a long time ago, which other countries have done, is that the prevalence of disease as it continues to decrease will decrease the predictive value of all tests, cytology, HPV, and colposcopy, because the prevalence of disease is going to be so low in vaccinated individuals. So this demands that we relook at our secondary prevention strategies because they're not going to work in the same way. We've heard of the wonderful work that was done by Dr. Papadopoulou, but now we're in a different era and the performance uh, has changed. And that's why countries such as Australia, UK, where vaccination is over 80%, have remained flat in their cervical cancer prevention efforts. Most women who get cervical cancer in these countries that are, have vaccination are, are, are either those that have not been screened or never or not in the past five years or are not vaccinated. So what are we going to do in the United States? Now, before I, I get to that, let, uh, let's uh, look at how screening has uh, evolved. So it was uh, in 2003 for the first time that HPV testing actually came in as a screening test along with the pap test. And yes, we were the only country that has co-testing. Most other countries either do, did only conventional or did only liquid base. Uh, but we introduced a second test and HPV testing actually gives you a very high, much higher negative predictive value than a pap, so you can increase the interval of screening. So co-testing in 2003 was introduced with a three-year interval. By uh, 2012, um, the uptake had uh, increased. It became the predominant screening method, the pap plus HPV in the United States. And in, two, in the 2012 guidelines, it became the preferred option. So cytology with reflex for ASCUS was still there. Uh, and this became uh, the preferred one. So 2014 saw another huge change. In the United States, primary HPV screening was approved by the FDA. I happened to be uh, the president of the American Society of Cytology that year, and you can imagine it created a lot of turbulence with workforce issues and, uh, and also much concern, not only from the pathology, community, but also from our patients as well as our clinicians about the fact that we were an opportunistic uh, screening program here without any recall, etc. And we were not prepared. We have too much variation, too many labs doing too many things differently. So we didn't feel that we were ready to implement primary screening at that time. And in the 2012 guidelines, it, it had been briefly considered, but the same conclusion had been made and it was not included in 2012 guidelines. So it was approved. It had very, very minimal uptake for many years, less than 1%. In 2018, the United States Task Force, whose guidelines often uh, uh, are very important for insurance coverage, came out with their uh, draft guidelines, which were open for public comment period. And in these draft guidelines, uh, they dropped, they suggested dropping cytology and co-testing and having only primary HPV screening as the screening option in the United States. There was again, a lot of uh, concern from all of us. So we jointly, uh, the ACOG, ASCCB presence, our consortium, uh, all of us got together and we wrote into them and the advocacy effort did prevail. Um, I'm not here talking about the science that supports the change, but the preparedness of the United States to actually implement this successfully without causing an increase in cervical cancer. So um, no, nothing changed. We were still very low in our uptake of HPV testing. So at this time, we were looking at these developments. Uh, doc, Dr. Solomon had retired by now. So Dr. Wilbur, one of, uh, who was actually my fellowship director, um, joined me in, uh, in the update that we did in 2014. So at that time, we felt that, you know, the demise of the PAP had been exaggerated, wasn't going to go away from the United States for some time, no matter at, with the approval occurring of HPV testing in 2014 as well. But we did feel the urgency to address the fact that 
the prevalence of disease had changed in va with vaccination and the positive predictive value of cervical cytology and its sensitivity had to be improved. And also that it would, for those who were going to use primary HPV screening as the screening modality, when that was positive, then the cytology was going to be actually now used as the reflex for an HPV positive. So it was going from becoming, a, from being used as a screening test to now a diagnostic test. So a diagnostic test with a low sensitivity, if it has a good specificity, was again going to be a problematic. So we decided to do an update. This was, uh, we didn't hold a workshop. It was through the ASC. We had a task force and an open comment period with draft recommendations, uh, which were basically um, not significant because there were no, no terminology changes except the age for reporting benign appearing endometrial cells. Um, the update was really more concentrated on refining morphologic criteria, especially everything that we'd learned about liquid-based cytology spitfalls over the, these 13 years since the 2001 update when this was new. So it was a much thicker one, but was really aimed at the cytotechnologists and pathologists to give them more clues, et cetera, so that they could keep up that sensitivity of the pap since it was still being used uh, as an important screening modality. We also did a new website, uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, another inter-observer reproducibility study to see had those education endeavors and the tightening up of ATPA reporting, et cetera, made a difference. And actually it was really nice to see that there was some improvement in concordance between the reproducibility study done in 2001 and 14 in all categories of the tester. So education does help and does work, um, but, uh, we, we still had to uh, have a few more, few, more, few more considerations as we move forward. So let's switch over for a minute to management. Uh, we, we're now by 2019, precision medicine, everything is you know, precise and personalized uh, in every area of uh, treatment. So why shouldn't prevention be precise? Up until this time, uh, women who had, two women had LCIL, they were managed in the same way. They were ASCAS HPV positive, they were managed the same way. But now we had much more evidence that, um, that the risk of a particular woman was not only dependent on her current PAP and HPV result, but actually on, on her prior history. Because as I explained, if you have a new HPV infection, you have a much higher risk than if you had a persistent HPV infection for a while. And if you have a HPV 16, and an H cell, you can actually skip polpo and biopsy and go straight to expedited treatment and have a leap. That risk is so high, it's in the 70s. So in 2019, um, I was on the steering committee for this management guideline update and we had pathologists in all the work groups. As I said, we've stayed very much involved in all of these guidelines. Um, so we developed risk-based management guidelines, which was a huge paradigm shift towards prevention uh, that was much more precise incorporating patient history, leveraging HPV biology. And in this HPV-based testing, either co-testing or primary HPV, because we haven't made those changes yet, forms the basis of the risk assessment. So it was like going from these, you know, algorithms that were so complicated for the clinicians, even there were, though there was an app, to now a risk-based guideline that's more like a GPS. So you still input um, all the information about a patient into this new app, and based on the information that you have, HPV, uh, the current test result, the prior test results, et cetera, it'll give you a risk score. And this is all in the back, happening in the background. This is being done by the NCI statisticians or with data collected you know, for years and years from the Kaiser system and also being compared to several other uh, CDC and other systems. So it works at, you know, across all uh, risks of uh, cervical cancer. And that basically that output will determine if a woman has surveillance, five year would be the normal interval, shorter surveillance goes to colpo, gets treatment or expedited treatment. Now these clinical action thresholds, the lower limits have already been dis <coughs> determined and will remain fixed. They've been done by based on literature review by the committees and consensus. Um, so today a patient with the same result may have different follow-up based on their prior history. And that is risk assessment method of management. 
So we, the ASCCP NCI group remains enduring in nature because we've already got <clears throat> new things that have been approved by the uh, FDA. We have the dual stain, we have extended <coughs> genotyping. So these are already being assessed. And once we're finished with our assessment, which will happen very soon, they'll go up for consensus voting and then they'll enter this risk assessment. So there doesn't have to be these major conferences that you keep adding new modalities at the time when we're ready to add vaccination, that will become uh, incorporated also into these risk calculations. So it's a pretty amazing system, and it really makes sense that you shouldn't treat everybody the same way. So more recently, um, the American Cancer Society has now come forth with uh, primary HPV screening as the preferred modality uh, in the United States. And uh, they've clearly stated that there will be a period of transition. However, in future guidelines, cytology-based testing will not be included in the guidelines. We're waiting for the task force, which will come out with their guidelines any day. Um, we don't know if they're gonna be the same as this, given a period of transition or not. But the ACS uh, also um, you know, is um, uh, cognizant of the fact that a transition period is needed. So they have set up um, and sponsored this screening initiative in which there are six work groups we've been assigned to look at all you know, the critical barriers and challenges to implementation. Uh, they include patient provider groups, as well as uh, uh, IT billing, and then the laboratory work group, which um, I'm co-chairing. So we've been working for about a year and a half. We'll be uh, rolling out resources very soon. And um, in the meantime, there's also self-collection pending with the FDA. So if self-collection gets approved, that's only primary HPV based. Those will be vaginal samples. So that'll give prime, that for that primary uh, implementation of primary HPV will become important um, in the United States, just like it has in other countries, because we already have the data that it's equal to physicians collected samples. So um, at this point in time, we have both the scientific knowledge as well as the tools to eliminate uh, cervical cancer. And the WHO has issued a global strategy call for this elimination defined as a threshold of four per 100,000 women. And they have targets of 90, 70, and 90 uh, for countries that are um, lower and middle income to reach by 2030. So as I look back at you know, the 35 years since Bethesda was born, uh, it's paradoxical that instead of responding to CLIA 88 uh, and practice changes, Bethesda has actually led the way in so many areas. Uh, it formed, uh, you know, the bedrock for the research into the biology of HPV and cervical carcinogenesis. It, it provided a standardized format for the implementation of new testing that informed both cerv uh, cervical cancer management and screening guidelines, and it formed the prototype for the development of other reporting standardized systems in cy cytopathology as well as in histopathology. So the, um, I think success of Bethesda is really predicated on the sound principles on which it was based at its inception and the hard work of so many countless volunteers over these last 35 years. And, uh, I am um, so honored and privileged to have been part of this history. Thank you very much. So this is the reason why Ritu has been given uh, Life Achievement Awards by the International Academy of Psychology, the Papa Nicola Award by the American Society of Psychopathology, um, Lifetime Achievement Awards by the PSC. And um, she's incidentally, uh, head of the American Board of